It's really one of the most painful thing you can tell a journalist that truth doesn't matter anymore, especially a journalist who's put themselves physically and morally and you know emotionally on the line for mm -hmm. decades to tell that truth and to find that truth at risk of our own lives. It is very, very, very difficult to hear people say truth doesn't matter anymore, and I just don't believe it. Where there's war, there's Amanpour, read a famous New York Times headline in the mid-90s. And it was absolutely true, since Christiana Manpur had already covered Gulf War, Middle East conflicts and Bosnia. She continued reporting major stories from around the globe, conducting interviews with top leaders, receiving every major broadcast award, becoming a legend. She's currently CNN's chief international anchor, and she talked to IMED during International Journalism Week 2022 about the difference between neutrality and objectivity, how women's movements strengthen democracy, and why she refused to wear a veil in her recent cancelled interview with Iranian President Raisi. Ms. Amanpour, I welcome you on behalf of IMED and the Journalist Week 2022. It's so inspiring and an absolute honor that you're talking to us. Well, it's a huge pleasure to be here, not just in Athens, but in this beautiful amphitheater. And as you pointed out to me, your hashtag is a matter of trust. And I think We're that's a, a really great, great, trust. great slogan. Okay, but our conversation will be included in a series which is titled Small Talk, conversations about a world that is changing faster, that we can keep up with it. Mm -hmm. Do you share that feeling? Yes, in a way I do. I think that not only is news happening at a breakneck pace, but the number of platforms that are proliferating where we can get the news from is also increasing very, very rapidly. So that has a, you know, that has a, that has an effect of, I think, make, making people very tense, making people kind of wonder where to get their news from, where to go to actually understand what's happening in their world. And it's a bit nerve wracking. You know, um, I, I think that when there were just a few <laughs> trusted organizations, it was at least easier for people to navigate, to know where to go to get their absolute facts. Now it is very difficult, and I think the consumer, so to speak, people need to work a lot harder to know where to turn. So is the world becoming a place where we're making uh, less and less sense of? <sighs> yes and no. I think news always happens since time immemorial. I don't think news is happening any faster than it ever used to do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they're very difficult issues uh, at hand right now. You've got the war not far from here, the war in Europe, Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. You have um, the, the protests, which actually are, are quite optimistic, you know, in Iran and elsewhere for liberty. Uh, you have, obviously, a very difficult situation with the um, cost of living, inflation, energy prices. So there's a lot happening at the same time. You have elections all over the world, the midterms coming up in the US, but already in Europe, you've had at least three elections which have shown that some of the hardships that people have to go through or do have to uh, you know, survive can lead to more extreme political results. You're talking about Italy, Sweden, France? Well, I think France. Italy, Sweden, France. In my opinion, the jury is still out on Italy. I don't know. We all felt that it was a certain thing, and it is. I mean, Giorgia Maloney has a certain history, but how she's actually going to govern in 2022 is still an open question. She seems to have said, We'll obviously take her at her word, rather, we'll obviously, you know, follow her, not just take her at her word, um, that she is a, a friend of Europe, that she is a friend of Ukraine, and she's a friend of NATO, she's a friend of the Transatlantic Alliance. So um, we'll see. So 21st century seems like a babushka that produces one crisis after the other. Do you still get surprised by all of this? I, I do a little bit, although I've got used to it. Obviously, 9-11 was the shape-shifting event of the 21st century, right? For it really defined the end of one century and the begin and then beginning the of another. Crisis, but really 9-11 first, yeah. because it, in my opinion, sent everybody off into, into a weird deep end. There was a huge global reaction. There was an invasion of a country. Then you have refugees. Then, you know, then obviously you have the financial crisis. You have the pandemic. It is just a huge number of events that are colliding. And obviously governments have a, a hard hard time to navigate and to try to find solutions. Uh, but we as journalists also have to find solutions in in. In, in our role, what is our role at this time 
in our service to our to our audience. Have we lost the trust of the audience? I don't think so. I honestly do believe that's just too pessimistic and it depends on who you're talking to and who you're talking <laughs> about. Yeah, people who get found out for peddling f fake narratives and conspiracy theories and don't do their homework and don't understand what their actual role is in society. Yes, I think those people are untrustworthy. Those organizations are untrustworthy. The problem is that even though there are many, many institutions, many news institutions that have proved themselves over decades and that are trustworthy, it's, it's hard for young consumers to navigate because they don't know. They think everything is all are equal. So I believe that there needs to be a very serious media literacy and essential online literacy campaign. Children have to be taught in schools how to recognize the truth, how to recognize facts. They have to be taught where to look, almost like the good housekeeping seal of approval. I don't know whether that makes sense here, <laughs> but in the United States there's this thing. And you know, if you stamp it, then people know it's been vetted and it's probably, you know, more trustworthy well, than others. On the other hand, there is this constant attack on fact, as you've said. Yeah. You've been angrily critical on Trump's ad administration, for uh, example. Anybody's administration. Yeah. Mm. But uh, does truth still matter? Of course it does. One of my biggest... Um, it's really one of the most painful thing you can tell a journalist that truth doesn't matter anymore, especially a journalist who's put themselves physically and morally and you know emotionally on the line for mm -hmm. decades to tell that truth and to find that truth at risk of our own lives. It is very, very, very difficult to hear people say truth doesn't matter anymore. And I just don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe and I don't accept when people say there's no truth, that everything is uh, you know interpretive, everything is relative. It's not true that. That is not true. But there is you, factual, empirical and objective truth. Don't you agree that in this modern digital landscape, there are these information bubbles yes. where we can find yes. supporters yes. for yes, our and that's a point problem. of view, even if it's of course. Uh, totally yes. outrageous? Uh, it, absolutely. And that's a problem. I remember, I mean, you're, you're, you're sort of triggering a memory of mine, and this goes back a long time, when the so-called internet superhighway was first even broached. And I remember because I'm a foreign correspondent for an American network, and I've had to struggle to get foreign news on an American network. Like all foreign correspondents for American networks, it's hard to get the foreign, now it's obvious because you've got big issues going on, but it was hard to get certain stories past the, you know, past the, past the bar, so to speak. And I remember thinking, oh my, when this internet superhighway or this information superhighway comes in, it's going to allow people to go into their own lanes on this superhighway. They're going to be able to get off at whatever exit they want to get off at and, and just go into their own corners and, and, and absorb whatever they want to absorb, mm -hmm. you know? So it's reinforcing their own worldview rather than being exposed to others. So I do actually think that in many, many circumstances and for many reasons, that has been a net negative in the, in the basic acquisition of fact about your world so that you can make judgments about it. Mm -hmm. In this period of extreme polarization, do you ever get the feeling that you're preaching the converted? No. Have, you, have you ever experienced the, the sentiment of futility? Futility, never. I would give up. No, never. Mm -hmm. Never, never, never. I do believe that CNN, because it started when it started, it's not by any means the oldest news organization. But when we started, and, you know, the great, uh, I really do mean great media revolutionary Ted Turner, who decided to create something that didn't exist, 24-7 television. He actually did it in order to bust the monopoly that the three American networks had. And he also did it in order to bust the, the stranglehold around the world that a lot of governments had on information, so state-run media. When CNN you know, exploded around the world internationally and mostly with the first Gulf War. Gulf War it yeah. started in 1985, but it was 1990. Yeah, and, and it, you know, that democratized information because it allowed people all over the world, you know, they could somehow get it down by satellite or whatever. Even if it wasn't on their own TV stations, they could, they could somehow access it or at least they heard about it. So many, many countries, including dictatorships, um, 
where news was by no means free or unfettered, uh, they got that information. And it was a big, big uh, gift that Ted Turner gave the world of that. It was, it was like an information justice system. You know, before that, we had the BBC World Service radio, right? So that was really important. But nobody had had a World Service television, which is what CNN did. If you had to do a 30-second workshop, how to trust the anchor, what pieces of advice would you give? To the anchor or to the, <laughs> to, to the viewer? <laughs> to the viewer. <laughs> uh, I would say do your homework. I would say, you know, it, it really is up to you now to figure out who you're listening to, to choose who and what you're listening to, reading, accessing in, in whatever, whether it's a podcast, a radio station, a print, you know, outlet, television, whatever it is. I, I do actually believe, and I've actually been saying this for quite a few years, that you can't just sit back and blame us if you're not getting your you know accurate information because if you choose to get your information from a very suspect or or a very niche uh, outlet or something that's clearly either political or or you know just has you know its own point of view uh whether it, and it might even be sort of lies and conspiracies then that's on you now it's on you i really do believe that you can't just blame uh, the New York Times or the BBC or CNN or your, you know, your, your stations or whatever um, for not, because you're not looking at them. <laughs> you know, you, you have to search now. You have to be discriminatory. And, and mm -hmm. um, when I say discriminatory, I'm sure that's not the right word. You have to be, you know, you have to choose carefully where you put your trust even by doing some basic homework. Even journalists choose their side. And, uh, no, I disagree with that. You disagree? Yeah, I I'm absolutely disagree with that. You, we don't choose said, a side. You've said in the past, when you're neutral, you're an accomplice. But that's different. Neutrality, can, you can be a, an accomplice. Like, I, I covered genocide in Bosnia, right? What would neutrality have looked like? It would have looked like I was creating a false moral and factual equivalence between mass murderers and kids who were being sniped and slaughtered. And I wasn't prepared to do that. And that was my very first lesson in what objectivity meant. So object, objectivity is our golden rule, not neutrality. Somehow this got all mixed up recently. This idea of neutrality is not a good thing. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Uh, objectivity is important because what objectivity is in journalism, and it is our golden rule, means... Is it possible? Yes, of course. That's, I mean, I still practice it, obviously. It's the, it's, if you don't have that then you're all adrift. So what objectivity I learned in Bosnia means exploring all sides, right? So you, you explore all sides, but you don't, don't then conclude in the mistaken notion of what you think objectivity is that all sides are equally whatever, guilty or innocent or whatever, because that's not truthful. So my mantra is truthful, not neutral. That's what I've learned. That's my slogan. And some years later, you've, you've said that when you're neutral, you're just an accessory. I do believe that. I said it at the time because I got criticized, just like you're telling me now. I got criticized for, quote unquote, taking a side. And I had to think, and even within my own network, and I had to, uh, I had to figure out what I was doing and, and was that criticism valid? And I have to say, it was a time um, in the early 90s that neither the United States nor Europe nor anybody wanted to intervene. Mm -hmm. So for four years, I reported a mass slaughter along with all my colleagues in Europe, not very far from here. And, uh, and it dominated the headlines. I mean, it just dominated and it, and it really not just dominated the headlines, but it came very close to destroying the transatlantic alliance. It was the biggest security failure since World War II. It was the first genocide in Europe since World War II. Um, you know, first we called it ethnic cleansing and then it became clear what it was. And it's all been, it's, it's not me saying it, it's been adjudicated and sentenced and con convicted in The Hague. Was it the most dangerous, most atrocious environment? At the time, for you me, yeah. Yes, for all of us yourself? at the time, absolutely. And, I, and not just, again, it's not just anecdotal, it's, it's, it's factual that in Bosnia, it was the first time in the, in, the, in the era of journalism that journalists were deliberately targeted because those guys, the bad guys, viewed us as players. 
So that started this... In the chessboard. Yeah, and they wanted to silence us. And so we had so many colleagues killed and wounded in Bosnia. Previously, journalists died, but mostly caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. This time, we were deliberately targeted. Is this a story that changed you or the one yes. you consider your major accomplishment? No, 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 I, I definitely, yes. Bosnia tra changed me in every which way, professionally and personally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking back uh, in your career, is there something that you think you could have done differently, something you regret for? Yeah, I mean, look, I always wish I could get, like in Bosnia, for instance, right? It was very difficult to cross front lines. And in many instances, like right now, I wish I could go to Russia and interview Putin and all those people around him, as well as obviously doing Ukraine, Europe, the US and all the rest of it. That we, we do one side exhaustively and very well, but because the Russians have made it impossible for us to go and do any kind of honest reporting. If I went to Russia, I couldn't call it a war, <laughs> you know, a special military operation, which I would do, and I would say why I was saying it, but still you can't really cover it. And, and yeah, so those, those things I regret. I regret not, sometimes not being able to cover, sometimes because, fact, you know, the, the, the forces on the ground don't let you, sometimes, you know, maybe you don't think about it as much at the beginning, um, yeah. Maybe you can be in two separate places at the same time. You can't be at the same time, but you can be consecutively. <laughs> yeah. uh, combining motherhood and uh, had a, such a high-profile, demanding career, was it tougher or easier than you thought or expected? Oh, much tougher. Much tougher. Uh, when I was pregnant, I, I um, used to joke stupidly in retrospect that <laughs> I would take my kid on the road with me and that I would, you know, you know, this thing called Kevlar, bulletproof, and I would, okay. you know, wrap him in bulletproof diapers, nappies, and uh, take him with me. But clearly that was Didn't unreasonable. Happen. It did not <laughs> happen. No. I took him with me later on assignments when he was older. Uh, but it was much more difficult because, um, you know, when you, certainly for me anyway, I speak for myself. When I had my kid, I became a little bit more fearful um, because I didn't want to die and I wanted my kid to have a, a mother. And before that, I just didn't think about the danger. You, you know, when you're young, you're sort of, you feel you're immortal. Plus, if you don't have a husband or a kid or whatever waiting at home, you just don't really think about that <laughs> stuff. So, so it didn't occur to me until I actually had my child. So over these uh, four decades, you're active. Has the newsroom or the media landscape in general become a safer or more equal space? I mean, more equal for women, yes. Uh, safer, well, maybe since 2017, since Me Too, a little safer, but there's still outrageous uh, injustices and unacceptable, you know, when I say assault, not, ne not necessarily always physical, but, o but also, you know, intellectual and other ways. I mean, financial. you, you name, name and f financial to an extent, yes. Many women don't get paid as much as the men. And I don't know a single broadcast that ha broadcaster that has a woman in the C-suite, in, in the top levels, all the bosses are men. And I just don't think that can be right because I think women and men uh, should be represented equally because we have somewhat different thought processes. We, we bring an equal, valid, um, you know, sort of experience to whether it's administration or whether it's actual working in the field and um, again this isn't just because I'm a woman it's all all sort of the data is there if you look at the UNDP if you look at the World Bank if you look at the IMF um, they'll all tell you that if you have women equally represented across all spheres of human endeavor the whole community is more healthy more productive more successful happier are you ready for another 30-second uh, workshop? Of course I can. Okay. Having conducted thousands of interviews with uh, people that... I don't know about thousands. Ah, well, some, some hundreds of them um, with very important personalities that saved the modern world. Yeah. What's your advice on how to gain the trust of the interviewee and the audience at the same time? Um, I was about to say my job is not to gain the trust of the interviewee, but maybe it is. And I can only say this. I feel, because of so many people who I interview, I think they trust me because they know me, right? My 
my professional life has been an open book because of CNN. Mm -hmm. So everybody sees what I do. Anybody who's watching CNN sees what I do. Um, And so they have a template if they want to know how I'm going to do it. They just have to go and get a couple of interviews and or have their staff get a couple of interviews and tell them. Yeah, there's a record. And I do believe that um, I hope and it, it, it would be my proudest thing that I've been incredibly fair. Sometimes I'm really tough. And sometimes I'm not. It just depends. I don't treat everybody like a war criminal, <laughs> yes. you know, um, but I do treat war criminals pretty rough. And uh, I just believe that I hope that people know that it might be a little uncomfortable, but it's, 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 you're going to be treated fairly. I would like to close talking about the recent incident with President Raisi. Yeah. Uh, Would you wear the hijab, the headscarf, if the interview was conducted in Iran? Of course, that was the whole point. Mm -hmm. I didn't make a political statement. I didn't even make a statement standing in support of the women, although I really support them. I'm an Iranian woman and I really support them, but that's not my job. My job is to conduct an interview with the president who's creating that kind of oppression that results in the kind of death and protests against it. So I was very pleased that in the midst of all of this, I was going to get an exclusive interview with the president of Iran in New York. And then after, you know, days of organizing but through my teams and hours of waiting for him and, you know, a lot of effort was put in by CNN just to just to get the interview situation, the yeah. And, um, and then they come up to me and they say, having, you know, okay, he's resting, he's praying, he's this, he's that. Finally, they can't hold me off any longer. And they've run out of excuses. And they say, uh, the president requests that you wear a headscarf. Okay. He's a very religious man. I say, with great respect, I'm a very religious person too. But I'm in New York. And the law is not for me to cover my, my head in New York. If I was in Iran, I'd be covering my head because that's the law. Mm-hmm. And you know, because I've covered Iran so often, and I've interviewed presidents there, that of course I cover my head, my hair. But uh, so I just said, I said, I can't do that. I, I can't do that. So it went back and forth, back and forth. Please, no, please, well, no, well, you won't get the interview. And then I had to take a deep breath and say, well, That's, that's it. And I got up and I told my bosses and they said, absolutely. Look, it was a basic journalistic principle. No foreign government is going to influence a Western independent journalist in their own country. It would have been unthinkable from a journalistic perspective of me to have said yes. I mean, but unthinkable. Do you think it was an excuse? For I don't decide know. To avoid I don't know. I can't get into his head. Mm-hmm. I don't know. How do you reflect? But I do know this, that... Increasingly, um, the Iranian regime and, of course, the Afghan regime next door, I heard somebody say today, it may have even been Senator Gillibrand. I was listening to a, um, she's an American senator from New York. She said, and she was actually talking about American women's rights, the idea of politics based on basic autonomy of a woman's body is unacceptable. So American women are protesting and women in Iran are protesting and all over the world. And I think that, you know, in 2022, maybe that will be the the critical mass. Maybe women's movements will see democracy strengthened. Let's hope. So this is how you reflect, how you you see all the news and images that that are coming from Tehran and Iran over the past weeks, both as a journalist and as a a person of uh, Iranian descent. Yeah, I mean, I I see it. You you can only admire it, whether you're of Iranian descent or anything else. You can only admire the bravery of people who will put themselves day after day after day in the face of of certain crackdown. And there has been crackdown, as you know, and there have been many deaths, many injuries. And to see them stay out in the streets is, 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 it's heroic. You know, I know the Iranian regime calls it riots, 
but and maybe there is some there's always some violence somewhere that you don't expect in in any you know in in any uh in any demonstration but then the governments jump on that teeny weeny little 0.9% of of bad activity and they smear the rest of the protest with it we know that the vast majority of people in Iran and anywhere else arab spring for instance 2011 all over the arab world and you can you can list any number of places when people have enough then people react it's it's the pressure cooker syndrome thank you very much it was an absolute pleasure thank you thank you